Good afternoon, everybody. It's your favorite Thursday again. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome um, one of our own, Olivia Bruce, in HBO. Brand is very proud right now. <laughs> so Olivia Bruce was graduated with a bachelor degree in kinesiology from the Queen's University in 2015. In her undergraduate research project, Olivia looked into the acute fatigue-related adaptations of rope turning technique required to perform continuous double unders. And this work was published in the Journal of Sports Science last year. In 2016, Olivia decided to continue her academic journey and come to the University of Calgary to pursue her master's degree in Dr. Brent Edwards' lab. In general, she's interested in sport, and occupational biomechanics, overuse injuries, and wireless sensor technology. Outside the lab, Olivia is a world-class rope jumper. She competed for Team Canada at three world championships. And currently, she's a coach at the Skip Time Jump Rope Club. Olivia hopes to help the sport grow by coaching and mentoring um, to increase awareness in younger athletes. In a few months, Olivia will defend her master thesis, and she will share her finding of her thesis with us today. Now let's welcome Olivia with the title of the talk, Towards Real-Time Monitoring of Achilles Tendon Strain in Basketball Players, please. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Alright. So Achilles tendinopathy is an overuse injury associated with repetitive loading and cumulative activity often seen in running and jumping sports, like basketball. Achilles tendinopathy is a degeneration of the tendon, um, characterized by nodular thickening, which you can see here, and pain. For athletes, having Achilles tendinopathy means missing practices, missing games, uh, reduced performance. In a res retrospective study uh, of NBA athletes with Achilles tendinopathy, 14% of those athletes did not return to play in the NBA for more than a season. And those who did return to play showed reduced performance measures, uh, such as the player efficiency rating scores. So why is repetitive loading bad? Well, in animal models, we see kinked fiber deformations, fiber dissociation, and tears with fatigue loading. And these mechanically induced damages uh, are associated with changes in material properties, such as a reduction in modulus. So this figure is from a study by Wren and colleagues, uh, where Achilles tendons, human ones, uh, were fatigue loaded at different initial peak strains. And so as you can see, as strain magnitude increased, the number of cycles to failure, or the fatigue life, decreased. So this seems to suggest that the strain magnitude is related to the accumulation of damage. So a potential way to uh, prevent injury could be to either reduce strain magnitude or reduce the number of repetitive loading cycles. Now, if you're a competitive athlete or a professional athlete, you're not likely to reduce your number of loading cycles significantly. So how might we reduce strain? Well, shoes and surfaces are something that we can fairly easily control and change. There's a very wide variety of shoe constructions available on the market. And even within the NBA wood court surfaces, there is a range of stiffnesses. So these two factors may be potential ways to reduce strain magnitude. Quantifying strain involves a combination of experimental measures like dynamometry, EMG, and motion capture, as well as medical imaging such as magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound, and musculoskeletal modeling. Now this isn't feasible if you wanted to monitor internal loading, such as strain, on a day-to-day -day basis for your athletes. So wearable sensors might be a potential tool that we could use uh, to monitor strain through a surrogate measure. So we wouldn't be measuring strain, but we'd be using something else that relates to it. So during a jump landing, the foot contacts the ground and there's an impact force. Segments decouple and accelerate, and 
muscles contract eccentrically. These eccentric contractions put stress on the tendon, resulting in strain. So it's possible that there might be a relationship between strain and some information we get from wearable sensors, but we don't know if what that is, if there is anything. So the objectives of this study, the primary one was to quantify the influence of surface stiffness and footwear cushioning on Achilles tendon strain in collegiate and high school basketball players during counter movement vertical jumps. The secondary aim was to quantify the relationship between Achilles tendon strain and information from accelerometers during vertical jump landings. 30 participants completed the data collection protocols. Uh, these athletes were uh, all male basketball athletes competing either on high school teams, university varsity teams, or the top tier of the intramural league here at U of C. So our data collection protocol involved a dynamometry and ultrasound session, oh, here we go. and a motion capture session, and then both of those went into a musculoskeletal model. I'll start with the dynamometry and ultrasound session. So participants were seated in a dynamometer or a biodex dynamometer as shown. Uh, EMG electrodes were attached to the medial gastrocnemius, soleus, and tibialis anterior muscles. An ultrasound probe, which you can see here, was uh, secured over the myotendinous junction of the gastrocnemius muscle and the Achilles tendon. Following a warm-up, participants performed a series of five-second ramped isometric contractions at various force levels, uh, which are detailed on the slide here. A passive trial was also performed, and tendon resting length was measured with the ultrasound at the end of the session. This is an example of the ultrasound video that we collected. So to orient you, the, sur the skin is up here, and this image is looking into the leg towards the bone. So we have the soleus muscle here, the gastrocnemius here, and the Achilles tendon along here, and the myotendinous junction that we tracked throughout the whole trial is here. Let that play again. So we tracked that through the whole trial to get a measure of tendon elongation. Torque output from the biodex um, was corrected for co-contraction using torque EMG coefficients and divided by Achilles moment arm, Achilles tendon moment arm to get force, and that was plotted against the change in length of the tendon. A second order polynomial was fitted to this data and stiffness was quantified for 10% uh, intervals of this curve. So you can see there's a toe region here and then as we get to higher force levels, the data becomes more linear. Achilles tendon moment arm was determined through the tendon excursion method. So during the passive trial, the ankle was moved through 30 degrees of plantar flexion. Again, the ultrasound video was used to track the myotendinous junction. And that change in myotendinous junction position was plotted against the change in angle. And Achilles tendon moment arm was calculated as the slope of this line. Okay. Next was the motion capture session. So retroreflective markers were placed on the pelvis and right leg for each participant. Accelerometers were attached at the tibial tuberosity and the forehead. And the, all the wires for those accelerometers went into this backpack here, um, where a mini computer collected the data from the accelerometers for us. These surfaces were bolted to the force plate, uh, which you can see here. And then an adjacent surface uh, was the same construction, but not bolted down. So the participant was, uh, had their right markered leg over the force plate and the left leg was on the adjacent surface. Participants performed counter movement vertical jumps and jump height was measured using a Vertec jump trainer. Okay. So they, did, they performed five jumps in each of the three shoe and three <coughs> surface conditions, so that's nine combinations. Uh, our shoes were provided by Adidas, 
Um, and they varied by outsole construction. So shoe A had boost material in its outsole and was our least stiff shoe. Shoe B and shoe C used a EVA material, which is typical, um, it's very common in outsole constructions for shoes, and they just varied in stiffness. So the 70C shoe was stiffer than the 55C shoe. <coughs> Now the surfaces uh, had the same construction on the top, but the subfloor was different. So we had a foam subfloor, a metal sleeper subfloor, and a wood sleeper subfloor. Now these are ordered for the surfaces in order of perceived stiffness. We're actually still waiting on the results of our testing and some information from the manufacturer to confirm um, those numbers and what they are exactly. Okay. So kinematic and kinetic data was used to create a participant-specific musculoskeletal model in MATLAB. All right. Force through the Achilles tendon was calculated as the moment about the ankle, which uh, was calculated through inverse dynamics, divided by the Achilles tendon moment arm, which was from our tendon excursion method, and we adjusted that for ankle angle. Strain was then calculated by dividing the force by the stiffness of the Achilles tendon, which we got from our uh, stiffness curve from the dynamometry and ultrasound session, and resting length of the tendon, which was measured using the ultrasound. So this is an example, um, just a representative trial of what Achilles tendon strain over the course of a landing would look like. Data from the accelerometers was analyzed in both the time and frequency domains. So in the time domain, we defined impact as the first 100 milliseconds after touchdown. And that's based on previous literature. We identified peak tibia acceleration and peak head acceleration, and then calculated an attenuation index, which was one minus the ratio of head acceleration over tibia acceleration and multiplied that all by 100 to get a percentage. The data was then converted to the frequency domain using a fast Fourier transform. Low and high frequency bands were determined based on the two peaks of the tibia signal. So the low frequency band was defined as 1 to 15 hertz, and the high frequency band uh, was 16 to 45 hertz. A measure of impact magnitude was calculated as the integral of the signal in the high and low frequency bands. And a transfer function was calculated for each frequency. Again, that is the ratio of the power of the signal at the head and the power of the signal for the tibia. Those were then converted to a linear scale, averaged within each frequency band, and then converted back to decibels. So all of the variables were averaged within each trial, and three by three factor repeated measures ANOVAs were used to determine um, any differences between surface and footwear conditions, and pairwise comparisons with Bonferroni corrections were used when relevant. Okay, so I'll start with the results of Achilles tendon strain. So there was no interaction between shoe and surface for Achilles tendon strain. And there was a difference um, in strain between the lowest stiffness shoe and the highest stiffness shoe. And it's kind of hard to tell with this graph. Um, the difference is pretty small, but we'll talk about whether or not that's meaningful in a bit. So the difference, the boost shoe, uh, the Achilles tendon strain was 0 0.002 lower than that in the 70C shoe condition. There was also a difference between surfaces. So Achilles tendon strain was lower by 0 0.004 strain in the foam con surface condition compared to the metal surface condition. And while there was no statistical significant difference between the foam and the wood surface, we did see a bit of a trend where the difference between those two um, was 0 0.003 strain. And as a note, the uh, error bars here represent the between subject variability, which was, we had quite a range um, in our participants. 
Um, but what we're looking at is mean differences and within subject effects. Okay, so we had statistical significance, but is it meaningful? Well, if we go back to the data from Wren and colleagues, uh, a decrease in strain from 0 0.052 to 0 0.050 resulted in an increase in fatigue life by 1,852 cycles. An increase uh, or a decrease in strain from 0 0.054 to 0 0.050 resulted in an increase in fatigue life by 3,098 cycles. So to put that into context, basketball players perform 50 to 80 jumps per game. That depends on uh, what position they play. So 1,852 cycles would translate to about 23 games worth of jumps. <coughs> And on the high end, if we're looking at 3,098 cycles, that's about 56 jumps. Okay, so what might be different um, in the landing that might cause differences in tendon strain? So peak ankle moment, um, if you remember from our strain equals our force, how we calculated strain, um, peak ankle moment uh, does affect strain almost directly. And it was decreased in conditions with lower peak Achilles tendon strain. Now, one reason why that might have occurred uh, was that the center of pressure location was closer to the heel in conditions with lower peak Achilles tendon strain. So what that would mean would be a smaller moment arm for that applied impact force that would need to be countered by the moments. Okay, also there was a slower loading rate in conditions with lower peak Achilles tendon strain. So it looks like there might have been a slightly different landing strategy um, between the conditions that would result in changes in strain. Okay, Moving on to the accelerometer data, there was no significant difference uh, in any of the time domain variables between shoe or surface. So there was a difference between <coughs> tibia impact magnitude uh, between shoes. And there's no interaction between shoe and surface. Uh, so we did see a difference uh, between the lowest stiffness shoe and the highest stiffness shoe, where impact magnitude was lower in our low stiffness shoe. Looking at impact attenuation, there was no significant difference uh, between any of the shoe or surface conditions in impact magnitude, but we do see a bit of a trend uh, just following what uh, our impact magnitude in our tibia was looking like. So a higher impact magnitude in the tibia would require greater impact attenuation if um, the magnitude at the head was similar. However, we did not reach significance here. When tibia impact was plotted against peak Achilles tendon strain, there is no correlation. Our, our squared value was 0 0.03. And the story is the same when we plotted impact attenuation against peak Achilles tendon strain with an R squared of 0 0.08. So why might we not see a correlation between the two? Well, peak Achilles tendon strain and peak acceleration are two different measures. And they happen at different times in the landing cycle, in the landing phase. So peak tibia acceleration usually occurs before peak tendon strain. That's usually about a tenth of a second on average. Tendon strain is also a measure of internal loading. Um, and it's highly dependent on material properties and tendon dimensions, uh, which is something that the accelerometers just don't take into account. Accelerometers are also sensitive to changes in effective mass uh, and are also influenced by uh, mounting strength, uh, mounting orientation, uh, where it is mounted on the body, and um, as well as the natural resonance frequency of that whole system. So to conclude, uh, shoe and surface conditions with lower stiffness resulted in lower peak Achilles tendon strains and that reduced strain uh, increased the fatigue life by 23 to 56 games worth of jumps. Additionally, measures from accelerometers were not correlated with peak Achilles tendon strain, calling into question whether uh, 
information from external transducers is really useful or effective for monitoring internal loading. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my committee, all those involved in this project, and my funding sources. Could you explain again what you did for the co-contraction to correct for Yeah, um, I actually don't have a slide on it. So okay. we took the EMG signal um, and the torque signals from all of our different levels of force. Yeah. Um, so we found max force and the EMG at that max force. Um, at each of those levels, we uh, created a matrix um, that related the two. Um, I can write it out. <laughs> And then it was a matrix division, so at least squares fit of those data points. Um, and so that gave us, you know, what EMG level we would have at a certain torque level uh, for each of the muscles. So then we took the torque, uh, the total net torque, and subtracted out or added, I guess you could say, um, the, um, the force produced by the t uh, tibialis anterior muscle. Okay, and then did you have, like you had the like subject specific kind of characteristics for the gastroc or for the Achilles tendon? Mm -hmm. Did you do that as well for the uh, like dorsiflexors in that case? Like did you take say the mm -hmm. moment arm of, of tibialis anterior as well? Or you just no. took so, that from another model I guess? So we worked in torque EMG coefficients so we didn't have to deal with um, that. So we ca accounted for co-contraction um, just in the for the stiffness, but we haven't done that using EMG for the dynamic oh, trials. Okay. If that's what you're asking, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah no, that's idea. that's something that I mean, we have EMG data. It's just something we haven't quite gotten to okay. figuring out. Yeah. Okay. Can you elaborate a bit on how you estimated the resting length of the Achilles? You accounted for the curve path Sure. Um, so we. Well, we measured the Achilles tendon using the ultrasound, um, and then we just used a, an equation from the literature um, that took that curve path, and so we used that resting length um, as our baseline, and it was all done at, a at 90 degrees, and then we just fit it, we adjusted it based on that curve. That's, yeah? To follow up the questions, I'm not entirely sure, like, such a small field of view of the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. How do you measure the implications? Yeah, the okay. Um, yeah, so this field of view is very small. The, our average Achilles tendon length was about 24 centimeters because our guys were all about 6'5, 6'8, something like that. Um, so we took, we found the position of the myotendinous junction using the ultrasound and brought that to the edge of the view, um, made a mark on the skin and then went down to the insertion at the calcaneus, made a mark on the skin, and measured from there, making sure that they were still strapped in um, to control <coughs> sort of lengths and ankle angles and whatnot. So it's, it's not the most uh, precise measurement uh, or accurate measurement, but it was the same protocol for everyone, and we're using that value um, as a constant, val or we're using that value for within the same value within all per that one participant. So, with our within subject comparisons, I don't think it would make that big of a difference with that error source. Scott? Scott? Uh, the question is about the attenuation. Was it? I, I'm not a little sure louder, sorry. Uh, the attenuation coefficient you calculated, mm. was it, if I understood correctly, between the nine view at the tibia and the head? Yes. Um, you have a force, you have ground reaction force as well, though, right? Mm -hmm. Did you also look at maybe the IMU acceleration versus what you measured at the force plate? Just because then it's just the shoe mm -hmm. in between, whereas all the way up to the head, you have all of the viscoelasticity damping of the yes. whole body, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I would think the shoe played a small role in the damping of your head. Right. Yeah, so we also actually looked at. Um, I didn't talk about it today, but we had two other accelerometers 
uh, one at the sacrum and one at the heel. Okay. Um, so we haven't really looked at the heel versus, or the tibia versus the force plate yet, um, but looking or at, heel yeah, heel versus tibia, I did that analysis um, and it came out non-significant. Another follow-up question. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you uh, because of the paint, Achilles tendon, because you mentioned that you did a tendon travel in the passive state. And, and I think some people have said that the Achilles tendon moment arm changes quite considerably when you activate the muscle. And I wonder if that was taken into account or somehow or... Um, so that's not something we've taken into account yet. Um, although, look, I was reading a paper that compared sort of the center of rotation method for determining Achilles tendon um, moment arm and the tendon excursion method, and it it was actually in the tendon excursion method there was very little difference between when they were determining Achilles tendon moment arm um, during a contraction and during a passive. But that's one study. It could be that something that we might need to look at. Maybe it's just a completely different question. So, would you recommend, you know, they had slight differences between the different shoes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the, in the strain. And so, would you recommend to wear a shoe where you have low strains or where you have high strains? Mm. Okay. Well, based on uh, the data that showed that increased strains uh, reduce fatigue life, I would say that um, wearing shoes that reduced strains um, would be a good idea. What if I make the argument that in a game I make 50 jumps or in a practice mm -hmm. I make 100 jumps, but I know that I can do several thousand before anything happens? So if I do 100 jumps and then I get a day of recovery, mm -hmm. if I have more strain, might I get more adaptation and my Achilles tendon might actually be stronger and so I want to have higher strains because I'm not going to do 10,000 jumps in one session. I'm going mm. to do 50 or 100. Yeah. And it might be better to have more stress and strain in my Achilles tendon because it might be that better. And yeah, it's, it's a possibility. Um, and it might depend on your individual and where your strains lie. Because we did have a big variation. Like some people had strains of 2%. And some people had strains of 6%. And for those who had strains of 6%, you might want to reduce that. A, I might want to think about reducing that a little bit. And I think it, even a reduction of 0 .004, um, you'd still be in the range of having a high enough strain to get adaptation without um, you know, endangering the fatigue life. I was wondering about the big differences in strain. Did you find, you know, because you had high school, teenage boys mm. and you know, 20, 22 year old men. Did you find that maybe you had more strain, let's say, in the, in the younger, the 17, 18 year olds, let's say, compared to the 20, 22 year old? Mm. So that's an analysis that we're planning on doing, and we haven't done that one specifically yet. I have done the analysis for stiffnesses, uh, which might give us an idea of where that would happen, and that's, uh, the stiffnesses were actually not different between our high school and university athletes. And I think some of our high school athletes that we got in that were 16, 17, um, looked like our varsity athletes. You know, they were 6'4 and 200 pounds of muscle. So if the stiffness of the tendon was the same and you used your model to calculate strain, then if I remember your model correctly, we essentially mm -hmm. mean all accounted for by a difference in the ankle torque is that correct? Ankle, so if I go back. So this one. Yeah, yeah. So ankle torque and then also stiffness. So we actually but stiffness is the same you said. Yes, for the most part. Um, if their forces were lower than they are ninety per so when we did that curve, um, we actually pulled the stiffness based on the force level. Um, in general, it was above 100% of isometric force, so we always took, almost always took the highest stiffness. But in cases when it was lower, we would 
match it to the stiffness curve. No, but I think what he's asking is, is the, are the differences, is it the differences in the moment mm. that are that are resulting in the differences between shoes and surfaces, right? Yeah, and that gives the differences in the shrinks there. Yeah, but I think when she's saying differences in stiffnesses weren't different, she means statistically there was no difference between high school athletes and uh, and university college athletes. athletes. Um, but we haven't looked between conditions. That, that, those stiffnesses don't really determine whether there's differences between conditions or not, because the stiffness in the models are the same. Okay. Exactly. Uh, two, two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, what was the height range? The height range? I mean, did they vary from five ten to six nine or? Um, I think our shortest athlete was 5'11", and our tallest athlete was somewhere between 6'8 and 6'9". So there was quite a difference in yeah. the growth of the people. Yes. And some people have postulated that the material properties that you're growing really fast mm -hmm. are not the same as if you're growing slowly. Mm -hmm. and so that, uh, that could be a, a, a different. Mm -hmm. My second question is your bar graphs on the influence of um, the floor and the shoe. Mm -hmm. If you do a dot plot, are there some people who are more influenced than others by those two different things? Yeah. Um, so I do have a few of these plots saved over. Um, so this is, uh, each line represents one subject, and the red line is an average. Um, it's a pretty busy figure, so I didn't include it initially. But yeah, so you can see that, and for the most part here, um, some were more affected than others, um, although there was generally a pattern. Um, in our tibia impact magnitude, again, we didn't have significance here, but there appears to be some difference in how people responded. Um, so that's something we're looking at right now and um, still trying to figure out what's happening here. Yeah. Because a lot of this depends on material properties um, and <coughs> genetics that we don't understand and, mm -hmm. and other factors. Uh, there may be some people at higher risk than others. Yes. Certainly. Bar graphs can hide a lot of things, so yeah. <laughs> that's why I, I guess I, I always like to see the variation of subjects mm. and see if they start segregating. Yeah. Because some people you can follow up in some ways and other people you can follow up in different ways. Mm. Yeah. So we've done those graphs for all of our variables, I just haven't shown them here today. Jared, this. Uh, sorry, I just had a quick follow up to your previous slide. I mentioned you corrected me. Achilles tendon moment arm for ankle angle? Yeah. Is that, does it, ankle angle, or does moment arm change with ankle angle? Is that something that's common in the literature? Or? Uh, so it does change with ankle angle. Um, there are a few papers that go over that, uh, how it changes with angle, and we picked one. Um, the, in what I've read, I haven't seen all that many um, papers that look at strain or even adjust for ankle angle and their forces, so. so. So the also the previous slide, okay. but it's really interesting slide actually. <laughs> uh, people are really consistent between shoe types, but you have two to 10%. Yeah, uh, so this that's one. Pretty, that's pretty drastic range. Um, sorry. Is that any compliance or is that strategy? Or um, I think there's some interesting things to explore within the subject. Uh, yeah, so we've started to look at uh, why we're getting that range. Um, so the coefficient of variation for the stiffnesses between subjects was 33%, and it was about the same, it was about 32% for the maximum forces um, or maximum moments. Um, so it's probably a combination of both, uh, both force and stiffness. Within subject, it was 33%? Between subjects. 
subjects. Between so. subjects, yeah. So what is the, the Achilles standard operating range typically in strain? Like, is the uh, operating in the toe region? Yeah. No. No? They, no. they go up, they go on the toe region. Yeah. Yeah. So the king ten is constrained by clock. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ten percent is quite high. <laughs> it's it's very high. Um, I'm not. We're still kind of working to see what's happening with those subjects and why we might be getting <laughs> such high values for them. Um, but it's it's very close to what's considered within their physiological range. Do you have data on the vertical jump of each of these athletes? It might be interesting also to consider mm -hmm. the kind of compliance in their vertical, their ability to jump, right? Um, yeah, so I actually, I've done a, I did try to do a correlation uh, between the two and there wasn't anything major, but we've, yeah, we've looked at that. Um, we could look at that further. Um, there was definitely a range in I think I have that over here. In jump height, um, oh, well, you don't see the range here, but uh, participants usually had somewhere between uh, 40 centimeters and 75 centimeters of jump height. So uh, there's a good range there, yeah. Oh, yeah, the 75 centimeters was very impressive. <laughs> uh, just to follow up on that um, about the range. Your sample plot showed a strain of peaking at around 7%, and I'm just wondering, is that typical? Okay, um, so yeah, tendons, we usually consider 8% kind of where they start yeah. to break, right? So 7% would be very high. I mean, most of the data where we figure out where tendons break at 8% is in vitro testing. Um, so when we're in vivo, they might be able to, I'm speculating wildly here, um, they might be able to withstand higher strains. Um, I think with some of our subjects, we had very low stiffnesses. Um, so I suspect that that might be the reason why we're getting higher strains for them. Uh, but we're still looking into that. Yeah. OK, and then uh, my real question is, you, you said there are two peaks, low and high frequency. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what are those? You know, at the low and high frequencies, what what is happening in the body that is mm. producing that? Okay. Um, so the impact force has a range of frequencies in it. Um, we've below 50 hertz. You're not really getting noise, so we don't worry about that. Um, the low frequency would usually be more like muscular absorption kind of thing, whereas the higher frequencies would just be impact um, accelerations. Um, that's my, we'll have to look into that a bit. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Um, so considering the, the mechanism behind um, the tendon rupture, which is like post uh, in flexion in, in a squeaky knee, mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, I mean, the end goal is to see how we can prevent this Devastating conditions like the rupture of the tendon, or at least tendon. Uh, but before it gets to the end of the, the continuum of the model of tendon pathology, uh, you have to think about other things. So, uh, did you consider the baseline confounders like um, maybe potential uh, potential differences between individuals that had tendon A and tendon pathology? Uh, because if they mm -hmm. have tendon pathology morphologically, they're more predisposed to maybe you know a more disorganized, disoriented tendon disappear. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that is not so structurally aligned. Uh, so this might actually be the most impo important compounder that I'm thinking of right now. Um, does that affect the model? Do you adjust for that? And how does that relate to the cycles you're trying to talk about? Okay. Um, so we only looked at healthy participants here, and we haven't really considered um, factoring in any sort of characteristics like that into like an injury. Um, predictor model that hasn't been developed yet. We were just kind of seeing whether or not strains would vary. Um, and there is some literature that kind of shows that once you have Achilles tendinopathy and your modulus is, or your stiffness is lower, um, so your strains would probably be higher. Um, but that's something that we haven't really looked at yet. 
of matter. So if I understood you correctly, you had one foot on the source platform and the other one was not. Yes. So you solved the inverse dynamics for one foot? Yes. Um, when a student of mine, Matt Jordan, looked at vertical jumping, he found there were even healthy people having distinct asymmetries. Mm. And I was wondering if you checked into that at all and whether or not some of the variability might be because some people just favored the foot that was on the platform and others might have favored the other foot, the other way for jumping. Mm. So we didn't account for that. Um, that's something we haven't, we didn't really think about. Um, just with the setup, uh, we couldn't do something like dominant leg versus non-dominant leg, if that might affect which one they favored. If it was really obvious that they were landing one, two, or if they were landing really heavily on one leg that we could see, um, then we made them do, redo the trial. And we did tell them to try to land equally on both legs, but that's to the, that's the extent of what we did for that. Yes, um, although I'm sure even small differences in asymmetry might have. No. But you could have other muscles that aren't part of the tricep surrey mm -hmm. contributing to the, the force. flexor moment. But you're just assuming that it all goes through the Achilles tendon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, 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 that, that could, could be why some of the strengths are really high. Um. I don't think you can do anything to fix that. Probably not, I and mean, we could just look into maybe, I don't know if anyone's done anything about how percentage contribution from each of the muscles to force. Well, I think, I'm sure people have used, like, <laughs> the buckle transducer data and tried to compare mm -hmm. it to the values that you get from an inverse dynamics analysis, so we should maybe make sure you look at that. Okay. Mm. 
Sure. Okay, so one of our exclusion criteria was any sort of pain or injury in the previous three months. And I know that uh, initially, when you get tendinopathy, a lot of athletes don't notice it at first when you start to get that um, inflammation. So um, we haven't had a physician look at it yet, but we also had our participants get MRI images of their ankles. So we had both ultrasound and MRI images, and um, it has been suggested to us that we get a physician to look. Something we've thought about but haven't gotten to yet, but yes. <laughs> No, we haven't done that. Um, we might be able to get participants to come back in, um, though this session, the combined dynamometry and ultrasound and motion capture session was three hours. Uh, and then they also came in for a 45 minute MRI. So getting them back in uh, might be a little bit difficult. It's not something that we've looked at yet, uh, but. I think it's something we're gonna get called on to do though. Mm. <laughs> I think it's important because if you're going to make conclusions yeah. based on one, mm. one measurement, you don't know if it's intrinsic to the individual or if it's yeah. the bad yeah. thing. Yeah. And we've done um, repeatability studies for the ultrasound dynamometry stuff, but we haven't done it for the jumping, so that's, well, it's maybe something Colin can do. Well, more about <laughs> ultrasound, we showed show that there's good reliability for three repeat tests, but you don't know what the test gives you when the person comes back the following mm. day for the same thing, right. or a week later for the same thing. Mm. And uh, I, I think that the st stiffness measurement is probably, the stiffness assessment is probably the most important thing for the strain calculation. The Thanks. magnitude of one, one last trivia sure. to highlight. Um, <laughs> were these done after basketball season or before? So data collection occurred um, basically from June through this February. So for the most part, uh, athletes were uh, playing basketball in some sort of league at the time or training. Um, we generally didn't have participants during their off seasons. But we got them before the national championship. Yes. Yeah, the, a lot of our varsity athletes came uh, sort of early fall when they were uh, sort of just after their fall tr or their late August training camp and they were starting to get back into their full out training. You should have said that because of your start date, you came national <laughs> So you're asking about the t expecting the two peaks as opposed to like the specific frequencies that we chose? Yeah. Okay, um, so that uh, bimodal uh, curve is very typical of what I see in previous literature for both running and jumping. Um, so we were expecting to see that and previous literature has done the same thing where they find that valley between the two peaks um, and kind of take an average of, they look at all their participants and say, okay, where is this generally hitting 
um, and then they pick the point. And uh, ours were fairly close to what previous literature had found. So. It's more about the value, not so much about those exact frequencies that you ranges you chose. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, just, I know your study is more on looking into the effect of shoes and surface thickness, but out of curiosity, um, have you looked into how the tendon, Achilles tendon strength would be when you jump effort? Oh, for like increased jump effort? Like higher it jumps? Or? Barefoot, oh, shoes. barefoot. Um, we haven't looked at that. And um, do, you expect, do you expect it to be similar values that you see? Oh, that yeah, the difference in strain, you yeah, mean? Um, well, the difference in stiffness was well. There was definitely a range. Um, of course, it would wouldn't be as extreme as going to barefoot. Um, I'm not sure if landing mechanics would be different in uh, barefoot compared to shod. Uh, I assume it would be slightly different, but I haven't there's I haven't done any reading to back that up. Um, I would expect, if anything, because there's less cushioning, you would probably want to land more flexed and try to cushion yourself a little bit more um, because there's no shoe cushioning to do that for you. Um, so I expect perhaps maybe higher strains, but I really don't know. That's wild speculation. I think, I think doing that will give more confidence um, to the people who are doing the research and then Seems like the shoes technology is saturated. Like, you know, if you change a little bit, you won't see a lot of changes in the tendon strengths. Well. So if you see like a huge difference when you jump barefoot, mm. then you say, oh, this thing is measured. Then it's definitely enough to, to measure the differences in the strengths. Perhaps. Um, although I think the applications, if we're looking at um, you know, basketball players, and that's where this, the grant for this project came from. Um, I mean, they're all, they all have to wear shoes. Um, but there is such a wide range. Um, we even asked our participants if they preferred um, low tops, mid tops, or high tops. We'd, I'd kind of assumed that they'd all prefer high tops, but a lot of the younger players, especially point guards, um, seem to prefer low tops. Um, of course, that has very little to do with stiffness, but you know, that might have an effect. Um, and there's such a wide range, especially now with like the barefoot or close to barefoot running shoes and all of that. There's quite a range of stiffnesses in the shoes. So I think in context, um, this range of shoes was um, applicable, but yeah, we could always look at more extremes. slides you show the kink structures and then mm -hmm. the increase in the fibula yes. I'm wondering if um, it is possible, I know maybe this is crazy, mm. is it possible that you see those features in the outer cell images? In the outer cell images. Outer cell images? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, so these are uh, pretty microscopic. Um, you wouldn't really see mu uh, micro tears on an ultrasound. Um, oh, uh, so those are those are individual fibers. Uh, so I don't think we'd really see that on an ultrasound image. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, you'd probably have to have a fairly uh, large tear to notice um, in the ultrasound images. Yeah. Any other questions for Olivia? Yeah. There you go, I need to speak to the mic. Next week, our invited speaker, Dr. Sean Gallagher, will fly from Alabama to speak about musculoskeletal injury as a fatigue failure process. I'll see you next week.